so I think you all know the panelists, but I'll uh, try and introduce them again. So on the end is uh, Shark Leader. Uh, then we have Nasir from NYU Poly, next to him. We have Stephen Fidel, Dan Guido from NYU Poly, and I said, and Rule, whose name I'm still not going to pronounce, uh, from Dispersity. Um, so we have a few questions, and we may not actually get to all of them, because uh, a couple of them I think are probably going to take up a, um, a good portion of the time. But um, the, the first thing I'm going to talk about is you hear a lot about um, uh, threats, and you hear the word sort of thrown around as this general catch-all uh, term for you know all the badness that lives on the internet and all the things that people are being able to do to our machines. Um, you hear about botnets, you hear about mobile security attacks, you hear about target attacks, APT, all this kind of stuff. Um, I'm just going to start with a rule and then for this one, everybody else can jump in as, as you feel. Um, rule in you know to your mind right now, what are the what are the real threats you know say facing enterprises um, and you know moderately sized organizations? What are the ones that they should really be worried about at this point? Um, yeah, go I go with the I go more like this. Why not? Um, well, for for enterprises, I think um, um, well. Basically, since 12 months or so, maybe a little bit more now, we have seen a true forking of threats. We have seen more, let's say, consumer-oriented threats and uh, certain gangs who are focusing on, on businesses. And uh, with the gangs focusing on businesses, uh, we see basically just um, threats such as Cubot uh, trying to infect a business and the more targeted uh, attacks such as, well, RSA to name, to, to name a, a big one. And uh, I think the, 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 the big takeaway is that even though uh, threats such as uh, used against RSA and so on, even though those were using a, a zero-day vulnerability to, to actually get into the system, uh, the, the main core thing was still social engineering. And this is actually something we have been seeing in consumer threats more and more, where uh, a lot of the gangs are, are not even bothering with drive-by downloads anymore and just asking uh, the, the person behind the computer to please run, run the executable because that, that seems equally effective. Right. Um, and Dan, you spend a lot of time in, in your job sort of looking at incidents that have happened, trying to help people understand how they got attacked. Um, just yank it out. It, it'll pop out at the top. There you go. Filled on your side. Um, uh, what are the, the mass threats a worry or is it more the specifically targeted things where somebody is spending some time doing reconnaissance on, you know, say, uh, you know, in a school or a hospital or something like that. They have some, a target in mind inside that organization, some data they're looking for, and they spend some time doing that. Or should they be more worried about the, the silliness, like you know, phishing attacks or you know, picking up USB keys off the board, loading malware that way. So I, I think as any organization, you need to be aware that all those things are out there and they're all coming for you. Uh, and <laughs> I think the, the, the kinds of threats that are really going to um, be uh, important to defend against are the ones that are able to scale their operations really effectively. And what we've seen over the last couple of years are that there are these very high touch threats, threats like APT and target attackers, that have automated out a lot of their operations to be able to target larger numbers of people more effectively. So they're approaching the level of scale that mass malware operates at, and that's an incredibly dire thing to me. Uh, because you see uh, more organizations like edu educational institutions, legal, uh, legal firms, um, financial institutions that are affected by the threats that predominantly affected governments in the past. Uh, and that's a consequence of these guys learning how to turn their, um, their intrusion process into like a business process that they optimize and uh, make more efficient over time. Um, so, uh, right, so the, the, the kinds of defenses then, I'll just be right into this, uh, that, that end up becoming effective against uh, these kinds of threats are the ones that disrupt those business processes. We can't just defend ourselves with little widgets of technology, uh, like relying on patching or relying on identifying specific pieces of malware, but we need to be a bit more aggressive and offensive about going out and essentially destroying, making it profitable, uh, the activities of, of the ability of these groups to scale. And is anybody doing that at this point? Uh, Microsoft is, actually. The yeah. MMPC goes out very aggressively and does uh, lots of botnet takedowns, and they work with local police, 
in various nationalities around the world to um, actually find the threat actors that are responsible for these kinds of things and arrest them. Um, and I think that's an important distinction to make, and I see this a lot in my students, where people confuse a threat with an exploit or a piece of malware. A piece of malware, like a, an executable on a file system, that is not a threat. A threat is a person, and there's somebody that's established a process for abusing information. That's a threat. And yeah, I, I think as time goes on, we need to have more threat-centric sort of defenses in order to actually make progress. And doesn't some of that, check I'll ask, ask you this, does some of that come back to uh, making you know, users inside the organizations as well as you know, home users, I'll just keep talking to them, <laughs> more aware of what those threats are, uh, you know, what the actual threats are and how they, they can defend against that, you know, just regular users, what actions they can take to help defend them, themselves and their organizations. I think you're absolutely right, but uh, let me. I wanted to add one more comment to the discussion that's been going on already, and that is money. I'm seeing within the last few, meaning five to ten years, money is the big driving force. So the, the, the threat agents who are going to actualize an attack are going to use this in some way to get rich. We don't see nearly as many of the, the teenage kids sitting in their bedrooms hacking all night and doing, doing something. The, the, the place that I worry about is the organizations that can actually turn a threat and an attack into something from which they can get money. So from that, you have to think, what's my vulnerability? What am I at risk of? If I'm a hospital, what is it that somebody could make money out of with me? Well, it's patient data. It's uh, patient private data. Uh, if I'm a, a bank, how does someone make money out of me? And Leading into that then is, unfortunately, as you say, and it's a lot of user education. Users have to become aware of these things, and that's really difficult because we've got new users being born every minute. Can I make the first disagreeal? Please do. <laughs> I think that educating users is giving up. I think it's admitting failure, and I don't think that we've investigated enough technical approaches to defending our client side attack surface uh, in order to actually um, be, be truthful to ourselves when we admit that the only thing we can do is educate users. That, that's an interesting point because I, I see so many panels and I talk to a lot of security experts and many times they say, oh, these users, they're so stupid. And actually, if you've sat down with a few professors and had dinner with them, all they complain about is their students. Uh, so it's the same thing. It sort of reminds me of blame it on the students and blame it on the users. But no, it's not the users. It's you who designed the system that way. That so I, I completely agree with Dan that that we should sort of of course user awareness should be there. You clean your hands up when you come out of the toilet, and so just like public health policy, we have awareness campaigns. We sort of have these awareness campaigns, but the blame really doesn't go on them. I mean, uh, There's no substitute for medicine. Right, that's right. <laughs> so, right. We don't start, stop producing medicine just because people are not washing their hands out when they come out of the toilet. And it's, uh, sorry. And another interesting, uh, another point I want to make about threats, and, and I agree with a lot of the, what earlier on was said, that you talk about threats, that one level is the criminals, right? The ones who want to make money, and, and they've always been there since the start of civilization. Criminals are there who want to make money. Now they have a different playing ground, different sort of things to exploit to make money, and they'll be there. And then they see, as Dan has shown in some of his work, they use standard techniques and have a sleep, uh, lose sleep over them. You know how to deal with them. And when money is involved, it's not easy to cash out that easily. There's certain bottlenecks there in the system that. Uh, and then the second thread is nation states, uh, of course, who are doing this uh, stealing IP from each other. And again, nations have been stealing IP from each other since uh, time immemorial. Uh, when one country has a lot of IP that the other one doesn't have, they do all kinds of things to get it. Uh, now they have just a different way of doing it. And uh, maybe the scale of the automation is sort of a little scary. But, again, uh, th but the third thing sort of that bothers me a little bit more, and it's not exactly a threat in the technical definition, is, is this whole business of cyber weapons that, that are coming into play. And there was an article in Business Week that sort of made me feel very uncomfortable for the first time about how there are weapons being created and sold for very large sums of money to government agencies. And uh, we have not been very good at, at using weapons. 
weapons. I mean, they, of course, these weapons are sold to responsible agencies, and they're not going to use them arbitrarily. But history has shown that we have misused our weapons. That something leaks out, and something bad happens, and, 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 and so and these are very powerful weapons. They're not going to be used casually, but sometimes it worries me that if some of these things go out, and the collateral damage that can come out of it uh, could be sort of scary. Yes. I, I wanted to uh, add something quickly just on the user awareness thing, going back to that. Um, I wouldn't take the view that thinking about user awareness and education is admitting the defeat. I think it's one of the things we can't regard as a substitute for the technology, but I think we've got to accept that users are, in many cases, the people who are coming into contact with a lot of the technology we need to protect them. They need to understand, A, why it's there, and B, how to use it. And I think quite a lot of the time, with user education, it, it seems where, where it's attempted, it gets left at the point of when you need to use this, please get on with it, without necessarily explaining and giving the rationale as to why something is important. So, I mean, just to take a simple example of something like passwords, and we, we have the standard guidelines on what you ought to do to select a, a reasonable password, and it, it's very much left, and you can see it on websites and everywhere you look, you know, select a password that's at least X characters, have this level of character composition, but we're not very often telling people why it's relevant to do that. And so we're, we're in a sense giving them half of the lesson and not allowing them to make that connection to, to why it's important to do it properly and why it's important for them to do it. And to, to follow on with what you just said, Stephen, again with passwords, one of the standard recommendations is, and don't write it down. Well, that makes sense if you're talking about don't write it down and stick it to a post-it note on the front of your screen where someone else can come by and see you. But if the threat is somebody many miles away or thousands of miles away, there's no harm in your writing it down, especially if you have to try to remember 50 different passwords to get into 50 different websites. I'm going to jump, jump back a second. So uh, about the cyber weapons thing, I'll make a slight distinction. Um, I'm not scared, uh, what, is, what is the line, the uh, love of the cyber bomb or whatever. Um, I'm not scared of the actual weapons that are being created, like uh, you know exploits and malware that are very professionally developed. Um, because, as I was alluding to before, the actual thing that makes these effective is the operational chain of activities that ties them all together into an intrusion. And that kind of operational activity is something that's very hard to develop. A business process is very hard to develop. Where, um, like one of these things leaked out like a broken arrow, and you've got. Uh, a highly effective exploit that's in many people's hands, um, that person is not going to be able to leverage it as effectively if they don't have the operational backing of a huge business process that allows them to take advantage of it. Um, the, the problem though, uh, so I will say there is another problem, the um, problem actually comes from these broken arrows that do get identified that fit into the business process of a given threat. So we see a lot recently uh, we, we've seen a lot recently where different um, APT exploits that are being used against United States companies have been discovered um, as part of failed intrusions, become public, and then get reincorporated into massive attacks that are used against consumers, home users, and other organizations. Um, that is a problem that's probably not going to go away for a very, very long time, um, and is one of the most significant things I think we have to deal with in current times. Uh, yeah, I can agree with that. Um, I think for a few years now we have seen that uh, after uh, random Adobe Zero Day was, was used against some uh, high value targets, it would then go into the public and would get into Metasploit or something like that, and we would see a lot of consumer infections or second tier businesses. Um, when we look at, for instance, the current uh, Dooku exploit, uh, the, the exploit that Dooku uh, leverages to to get system privileges on the system, um, that has not circulated at all in, in the wild, and therefore the, the fallout that we have seen so far has been negligible. So this very sophisticated attack used it, uh, these attackers used this exploit against the targets, and nobody other than these particular targets have so far been hit with this exploit, which uh, kind kind of could start a different discussion about the the, the good and bad. Of Metasploit, but maybe today is not the day to go into that. <laughs> if HD was here, I'd be doing that. I'll say one thing. Um, I part of HD? So I, I did a study earlier this year where I collected exploits that were in use in the wild by uh, large numbers of 
criminal groups used in mass malware attacks. So the very lowest order of attacks, but the largest volume. Um, and I couldn't find any exploits that were directly copied from the Metasploit exploit kit. Um, well, yeah, so there are random small little cases, but at least in the data set that I had, which was fairly large, um, it seems like the abuse of Metasploit exploit code in the wild is relatively slim. Um, except for Tom Ficker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is not small. Well, it's one out of many thousands of attacks that go on all the time. Alright, so a lot of you sort of touched on the user education part of it and whether you know that has any value, whether we should still be doing that and just work with our time. Um, what about the, the piece of it that involves, you know, I'll, I'll direct this to the academics on the panel, that involves, you know, if, if our systems are too complex and you know they're not uh, you know they're not securable the way that they are now, how much of that sort of uh, burden should should go on the universities and the and the colleges that are sort of training uh, you know, our next generation of software engineers and hardware engineers and system designers to sort of, you know, remove some of the complexity, make things a little more simple, a little more easy to secure. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, I don't think we know how to train with security engineers yet. We are sort of figuring it out as we go. Uh, we at Poly uh, try hard. We have people like Dan come and teach. We have people like Keith who was here in the morning come and teach. People who have real life experience, not just uh, academics. Uh, and we try to give them a good sort of grounding of uh, theory, concepts, practice, etc., etc. But there is this whole business of uh, so there's one thing about secure coding practices and things like that. So uh, more or less academia has, is slowly accepting that and things like that are, are getting pushed into the curriculum. In 1999, when I started a computer security network security sequence here at the undergraduate level, I think we were the second university in the country to have a security course at the undergraduate level. Nobody, had, nobody was talking about it before that. Now I think there are probably 100 of them who, who do that. So things are improving. And we're talking about buffer overflows and things like that in our, in our uh, programming classes. And we, we talk about quantum computing analysis, things of that sort. But I think more importantly, training a security engineer perhaps means uh, developing the security mindset. Uh, and how do you develop that in an engineer? Uh, I sort of don't know. Uh, I mean, we, we try to do that in our courses, but uh, uh, I think it's something that academia has to sort of learn. And, and it's, it's not that. Now, there's some like Dan and Julian and many others, especially the ones at Seesaw out here, who kind of naturally have that security mindset, which, which, which looks at trust relationships, examines them, and is able to sort of dissect the system and, and, and find where the problems could be or, or argue about its security properties. Uh, but uh, to do it in the large scale, to scale that up and have hundreds of students or thousands of students coming out with that kind of ability to think, uh, uh, it's something I think we, we need to do, but we're still not very good at it yet. Uh, in some, some schools like probably are trying to get there. We have a question. Like. <laughs> if I could just add to that, uh, that, that point, though, I mean, it's not just a question of the security design, which, as you say, is, is beginning to populate more of the, the courses on the software development, etc. It's important to see it all the way through the process, through to the interface that the user then gets presented with. So things can often fail at that level as well. So you've got a, a robust bit of software, or as robust as you can make it in terms of exploiting <coughs> vulnerabilities there. But then when the user actually is confronted with what they're expected to be interacting with, if the interface isn't clear, then it really does increase the chance of them misconfiguring, making mistakes, and doing things that render the system that could have been robust enough quite vulnerable as a result. So we've done research at Plymouth, for example, that's that's dealt with end users and it's looked at their abilities to interact with systems. It's done things like monitoring their interactions with security over a period of time and asking them to record whether they actually understood the decision they were being asked to make or if they had a security task in mind, were they able to navigate their way through the interface and the complexity to actually see that decision through. And in many cases we find, no, they don't understand the decisions they're making, so in many cases it's rather ad hoc and pop up. 
and in a tangible proportion of cases, even when they've got a security objective in mind, they then find that the system frustrates them in their ability to actually see it through. Dan, you can be a good person to answer this. Like, are students coming to the undergraduate level specifically looking for security as a concentration, or are they, is it more like... Oh yeah, they, they do all the time. Everyone's always drawn to like acting the movies and they want to learn security, sure. but they don't want to learn anything else first. And those are the students that I find fail immediately. Um, <laughs> the students that are the best are the ones that excel in other fields and then come over. Uh, the software engineers that are able to build and design great systems by themselves and then pick up security as a, as a uh, side field, something else to specialize in. Yeah. Um, a lot of the engineers tend to do better than the scientists. I uh, don't know why. Um, but yeah, I don't think that security is really a first order field. You kind of need some other discipline to fall back on to apply your security expertise to. Um, and it only works in rare cases where you're a pure play sort of security person. Um, another thing that I just want to mention, I don't think you probably want to respond to that. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I try and teach kids security in my class by actually helping them understand how easy it is to perform attacks. Because a lot of people just assume that the world out there is so friendly and nice and everyone is great and that they're totally not going to get attacked on the internet. Um, but I walk them through the steps that an actual attacker would take to show them just how easy it is and to show them that um, like these kinds of attacks are possible. So the way that I go through it in my class is we do practicals of simulating attacker activity against many different types of software and many different activities they would have to perform. And it's usually a very engaging sort of class where um, it's fun and the skills you get out of it, even if you don't end up staying in security, you realize uh, your, your realm of possible has been expanded. I want to jump in and, and pose a question to the panel since that's Please. an easy way of getting out of having, having to answer questions <laughs> myself. My question is all that you've been describing recently works really well for students who are in a computer security class. But we all know those are not the only ones who are going to go out and design and implement systems. How about the ones who don't take security? How about the ones who, who spend their entire time doing artificial intelligence? Who spend their entire time doing networking? Or pick, pick any uh, specialization that you want to. And somehow avoid, not intentionally, all of this good security training, all of the black hat thinking, all of the the things that we we see as being necessary. How about them? Well, I think some level of it needs to be integrated into whatever discipline they're studying. And so if they're looking at networking, for example, then there will still be the opportunity to have even those other dedicated security units, some focus within that on the vulnerabilities that that environment will occur. Similarly with artificial intelligence, they're building systems, and so there's a, a a potential there for some of that secure design and the, the standard issues around software vulnerabilities to find its way in that context. Absolutely true. Now, does that exist? It varies. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say I think the way that we handle this at Poly is we try and do a little bit of outreach to the rest of the um, organization that we have here. So we have a computer security club, we offer pizza to our students in, and there are other students in the lab like uh, Julian Cohen, whose name has probably been brought up a thousand times today. Uh, who will give short demonstrations of, hey, look at this cool thing I can do. And usually it's destroying the um, you know, security policy, whatever idea that someone had about proper functioning of that system. And usually that's enough of a hook to get people involved. Like, oh, what is this? Like, how does this work? I can't believe you just did that. Um, hacking tends to be a pretty addictive field when you yeah. see a good demonstration. <laughs> so if you look at reliability, you know, that's uh, kind of an accepted elective that a lot of people take. Uh, engineers, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, anybody, uh, they need to study reliability and uh, how to build reliable systems. And we're good at building reliable systems. Uh, and I think probably something of that sort needs to be done in security that we need some sort of uh, uh, how to build secure systems and for mechanical engineers, mechanical engineers available as an elective so they understand the basic concepts of uh, threat models. And they, they understand what's a threat, what's a vulnerability, what assumptions, trust relationships. I'm not talking about RSA, cryptography, or ideas right. and things of that sort, but just yeah. basic concepts, risk, and things of that sort. So perhaps something like that is needed, and every engineer then should have that option to understand basic principles of security. So there should be that course available. I think I've been 
talking about it, but have not done it yet. So, it's something that we should do. It also might not be a bad uh, way to approach the, the regular home user problem as well. On a lower level, the, what Dan described, showing people what an attack looks like. Uh, you know, instead of just telling people that you know, if you don't choose the wrong password or if you don't do this, bad things will happen. Show them how many system administrators that are responsible for patching systems have seen an actual buffer overflow exploited. Yeah, if you can bring that number up, you're doing a good job. <laughs> Engineers study strength of materials very early in their curriculum. We've got people building systems with components whose security properties they have no idea about. Right. We also see them consistently breaking the formal interface of those systems and using them in ways in which they were not intended to be used. So we're, we're, this, we're not teaching fundamentals in, in uh, security engineering that every engineer learns in his first year in, in engineering school. And then we expect them to be able to put things together in a, in a reasonable and reasonably safe and secure manner. This question, I think there was a question over there. Oh. We'll repeat it. Okay. Uh, my question is: Have any of you guys seen anything <laughs> that's like an apparatus outside of the outside of the PC? The apparatus would be something like a uh, go back to register, uh, go back to register databases, or go back to a uh, secured vault to check it. Something that would take maybe an extra two, three, four percent overhead onto the connectivity to the net, but would offer a great deal of ongoing security. Is anybody looking at that kind of an apparatus? How would that Chip set base or whatever. Sort of a checklist kind of thing? No, it would be a chip set base in between uh, on the line. I, mean, I, I, I don't know if something like that would work. And even if it did, it's just another widget to get blown out of work by an attacker. Well, if you shut down most of the pathways and had it registered to a uh, like, like they do with e-commerce, they register to a, uh, to a bank, an online bank. You can register the stuff, and you guys are dispersing, and other people could keep feeding it up to date. It would be a little bit of overhead, but it would basically make anything coming into your machine be subject to uh, uh, to scrubbing. It's a, it's a different way of concept. So I, I think what, what you effectively mean is some sort of cloud concept that uh, when the machine receives an incoming file that it's like uploaded into the cloud and some analysis is performed, is, is, is that effectively yeah, what you're or, getting? Or maybe a, 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 a checkpoint that would be checked, you know, so a, a hash, hash code check, that kind of stuff. Right, right. You don't have to send a fire file. Uh, right, actually th this is uh, something most of the, uh, let's say, more, more advanced uh, anti-malware solutions are doing right right now. Uh, when you participate in, in, in whatever cloud equivalent they have, at minimum some metadata is uploaded into the cloud and is, let's say, cross-referenced. Uh, uh, we, for instance, also have some reputational databases, so we can actually see, oh, this is the very first time we see this particular file. and. Uh, if, if wanted by the customer, the, the pop-up can, can show and say, oh, you're the very first person in the world to see this file. Are you sure you want to run this? So it's, it's not a perfect solution, but it, it's not a layer. Uh, this great academic research paper called Cloud AV from a guy named John Overhead that's here today. Is he actually in the room? Um, documents how such a system might work. So kind of going back to the user education thing, um, I, I, from what, what, like what I see, it seems like user education right now really is it's, it's a broken down like the C level of the executives and stuff and understanding that they need to like spend a lot of money to educate their IT department first to build these systems and build them out. Um, but they don't understand the necessity of spending that money. And what's the problem, problem you're trying to solve with education? Well, it's getting people that make decisions of where budget goes to spend money on, you know, making a system that, and having an educated IT department. <laughs> do you agree with that, or do you think that that's not part of the problem? Well, I hope that IT departments have educated people. Mm -hmm. and, and that they, they have a good of science like degree and stuff like that. Right? So, pardon? It seems like it always comes back to the amount of money you can spend. Like, IT is always too small. Or even the yeah. security department. Yeah, the money yeah and one thing I see, my favorite sort of, uh, sort of whining thing, oh, no, whatever, the, the, the 
one thing I see is a lot of these departments spend money on these certifications, which I think are basically stamps of mediocrity. Uh, CISSP, according to me, stands for certified, I suck as a security professional. <laughs> so, so they spend their money on CISSP and all such things, and, and uh, so they, should, they perhaps could be spending it better by sending them to Poly instead. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, so in that sense, they should be but making sure the IT understands security very well. Is that the yeah, I was just asking if you guys think that that is a large part of the problem is that money is spent the wrong I see, yeah, so I see a lot of IT people who know nothing about security. Yeah, that's a problem, yes. Well, I, I want to go back to the RSA example, which was, uh, really is a good one to talk about user education because, as it turns out, uh, initially the spam filter had actually caught uh, the, the email that was targeting RSA and uh, the person who opened it actually retrieved it from the spam folder. But let, let's take another step back. Why, why was uh, RSA targeted? The going theory is that uh, the attackers weren't actually trying to go after RSA, but rather uh, go after Lockheed Martin. And by that we can only assume that the attackers actually initially tried uh, to, to attack Lockheed Martin and then failed. So uh, such similar emails were sent, and maybe the people at Lockheed Martin, well, they, they were a little bit smarter, they didn't open the attachment, uh, so they actually went through a third-party company and then attack, attack Lockheed from a technical point of view. So even when, when as a company, your, your, your social engineering uh, uh, education is at a good level, you can be dependent on a third party get, getting on. So you need to spend time and money on, on both sides. So the customer succeeded and the security company failed. <laughs> If uh, successive surveys over the years are to be believed, I, mean, I think it's, it's recognised by organisations themselves that they're not putting enough effort into the education issue, and then what they're finding in terms of the incidents they're reporting in the same surveys is that a fair proportion of them, in, in some cases the main incidents, are coming down to things that could have been prevented by user awareness. And if I remember correctly, the latest CSI survey, um, investment into things like user education is the one area that's flagged up that they feel that they're under-investing related or when compared to other aspects of security investment. They think it's insufficient what they're doing there compared to the technology. That's not to say that the technology needs to be reduced, but it certainly flags up that lack of education is something that is causing problems and recognised as being a lack of investment. So we started off talking about uh, executive awareness of security issues, and that's something I totally agree with. Um, and it's something that I see a lot of organizations fail when they don't have a very, very easy sort of uh, barometer for figuring out if an organization is well put together in terms of security or not, is where in the hierarchy their top security person is, and uh, maybe what that person's background is. And what I hope to see is over a period of time, it's very hard to teach these guys anything about security, so over a period of time, more people in this room and more people that have uh, experience from companies like AtState or ISIC Partners start to become those C-level executives and are able to push and argue for more effectively a larger par uh, part of that pie. Um, on the user level, though, you guys started talking about uh, like phishing emails and stuff, and that's where I start to completely disagree with the user awareness part. Because by training users, you're basically saying to me, um, look at all these different places where we fail to protect you. And I think that there are options that we have as a defender to implement techniques that completely eliminate that attack vector. And it's also too much of a microscopic view on an exploit as being the attack. An attack is composed of many other things that have to occur. And there are multiple places where we can catch uh, attackers, not just at the point at which they gain execution on a, on a computer. Um, because there are many things that happen before then and many things that happen after them before they actually accomplish something of value. Uh, well, well, that's true. I mean, if, if, if the targeted attack email is actually caught by the spam filter, that should be a security success. When, when, the, when the, the employee decides to override what the security software does, I mean, that, that, then you're still talking to some user. There are other things involved in that. Like the person had to um, send it from a particular email address. They had to have a callback domain uh, for that for that uh, Excel document after it exploits the computer to talk to. 
had to download a second stage payload, had to write files to disk. I mean, there's so many other things true, happening besides that. I'm talking about here. the pre execution detection. I mean, detecting poison ivy or, or whatever post execution. I mean, you can write some behavioral signatures and you'll have a quite a strong detection, uh, no, no matter what packer or crypto or, or whatever they're using. But I'm just looking at a pure pre execution state in this particular uh, case. You, you kind of bounced around amongst the panel about the um, economic influences from the attacker point of view that we kind of shifted to this thing where um, it's not really like a single entity in the basement, these large entities that have, they, they want to make a lot of money, right? Or the nation states that have like IP that they want to steal. Um, the gentleman up here, I don't know who it is, but he brought up the IT departments are allocating money um, inappropriately. And what about the, the economics on the defensive side, right? Like at one point in time, we wanted to spend lots of money to like make secure operating systems. Right? Now we've kind of given up, right? It's economically good and such that enterprises buy with us. Like we don't care, we're gonna try and hash and do all these things that we know won't make secure systems. But like that's how we're driving it, right? The US government, I don't know about other governments, the US government is like they have to use COP software now, right? Like they sort of like abandoned this hope of making the, the secure system. So uh, at the macro level, how does the economics work on the defensive side? So I think if you want to talk about that, you actually need to look at how the economics work on the attack side first because the attackers are actually very constrained in what they can and can't do. There's not just an unlimited number of possibilities of exploits that they can write and malware that they can write and techniques that they can use and people they can put on that problem. So the ways that they exploit that insecure software is actually very a very repeatable process because they have to make it scale. So when you do want to defend against those people and you want to defend it on the cheap, when you're some company that is not a nation state and needs to defend against one, um, your options are actually very good if you're familiar with how that person is trying to compromise you. Because if they're only using exploits that come through IE, if they're only using a particular, like malware has to write to this, they're not using, if they're not using memory resident malware, or if they're all coming from a particular hosting facility, or whatever it is, um, there's a lot of different options that you have that don't involve being a nation state, to, uh, or nation state level resource to defend. Um, best answer I can get, give you. <laughs> so we're almost out of time, but one thing I wanted to get to before we finish up is um, it's completely off topic of what we've just been discussing. But um, talk, going back to some of the, the um, ethics and the way that the security industry works, there's been, you know, Dan mentioned uh, the Microsoft Digital Crimes Unit and what they're doing with botnet takedowns and going after, you know, helping prosecutors not just in the U.S. but uh, overseas as well. Um, go after attackers, find them, bring them to justice, that sort of thing. Um, and some of the botnet takedowns, uh, you know, one specifically recently that Kaspersky helped with and Microsoft helped with, you know, it got to the point where uh, the good guys owned this botnet. They, they had complete control over it and they, they got to the decision of, should we not only notify the, owned, the owners of these owned computers and tell them that they're compromised, but should we help them clean them? Should we figure out some way to push out an update that will remove this bot? Um, which is, you know, this sort of gets discussed in the security industry a lot, and you never, I never really hear um, uh, any sort of consensus on it, but, which is probably good, but uh, there's a lot of ethical and legal concerns. Well, I know you've talked about this, and we've had discussions about this. If, you know, tell me who did some of the research on this, who did the, the, the I know what his thoughts are, but. What are your thoughts? If you're if you're sitting there, how do you advise the, the police? What what advice would you give? Do you think uh, you know, it's it's worth our time to help them clean these machines? Um, I think uh, looking at the situation that I've been involved in and looked at a, a numerous bot bot and takedowns, and in, in one uh, particular case, which I will not specify, uh, there was actually not not done by us, but. A, a entity actually pushed an executable uh, down to the entire botnet. And uh, I think on an international level, it was made quite clear that that was not a good move on uh, that entity's uh, behalf. And I think from that perspective, we, we will not see that happen again. Um, so, so I definitely don't see executables being pushed down anytime soon. I guess it gets more complicated when uh, botnets, or bots rather, have the some sort of uninstall command. Uh, do, do you want to push that? And I definitely am not in favor of pushing executables. 
Uh, maybe with a whole lot of a QA that, that we could push some sort of uninstall command if it's present in the bot, but even at that point I'm, I'm very, very hesitant. Uh, I definitely think that if such a thing were to happen, it needs to be in collaboration from, let's say, both public and private sector so that uh, people are very well aware of what's happening and not one particular company or entity running away with it and doing stuff that uh, may sound like a good idea but works out really, really badly. Because there's definitely liability concerns as well. I mean, you know, if you're a private company pushing executables to people's machines, even with their knowledge. You know. Right, I, I, I don't think any, definitely not any private company should be pushing executables. That should be left strictly for law enforcement. But then you get into a, a, a very peculiar, a particular situation because we see uh, these kinds of initiatives around the world uh, and, and maybe some people think this is a good idea when it's coming from, and I'm just uh, hypothesizing here, uh, from the US government, but how would the people here feel if it would be, uh, I don't know, the Canadian government or Canadian police doing it, or the Russian, or, or Chinese, or the Dutch, or uh, any... And, and speaking for the US government, which I'm not a part of, uh, <laughs> You also have to look at our image around the world. There are certainly places where we could push uh, correction code, if you want to call it that. We could push it to certain countries, they'd say, thank you very much, that was very kind of you. We could push it to other countries, and they'd say, what the heck are you doing touching any machines in our country? This is, you know, this is our sovereign territory. So I'll just ask a question. I'm not sure what gives people the right to perform actions on my behalf on my computer when it's not interfering with anybody else's. Because most of this malware is simply mining the activities that are going on on my own computer and I'm not harming anybody else. And I think the defining line is if I'm disrupting any activity that can be felt by a third party, then I say, fine, do whatever it takes to get that person off the net. But um, I don't see the, the reasoning for what allows me to do that when I'm not. That's a good point, because there are some, uh, some of this is happening at the ISP level um, in some countries where if there, if, you know, some ISPs have, you know, uh, security software installed on their customers' machines, and if they find that your machine is compromised, they're putting up block screens and not allowing you to, uh, you know, connect to the network unless your machine is clean, and, you know, it's sort of the idea behind Microsoft's Mac, the idea at some point, um, but, you know, but that gets back to what you're saying, and, you know, it, if they're finding out that your machine is attacking other machines, and they want to cut off your access to do that. That you know that seems okay to me. But uh, you know, cleaning other people's machines for them, even with without the knowledge, is a difficult thing. Yeah. Well, I think actually with all the botnet takedowns I can think of right now, I think there was always some effect for for third party. Uh, but when you look at Zeus, for instance, we well, we, you you have the Zeus tracker and a lot, lots of these. Uh, uh, panels, these admin panels, they, they are protected with default passwords. So theoretically, somebody could go in and basically nuke the entire botnet. But that's not somebody. That's not something that's actually actively happening. So, but as I said, we, we need to tread very very carefully from my point of view. I just add, I think it's something that, well, somehow, if it's going to be done, it has to be sanctioned and the user has to have agreed and accepted that this is something that could be done to them. So, I mean, if you've got the ISP example and within the terms of service, for example, the user could sign up and accept, yes, if they read the terms and conditions that the ISP could have the right to intervene in that way. But if you think about sort of human vaccinations and things of that nature, even if we're a carrier for something like the flu, somebody else doesn't have the right to come up, break into our house and stick us with a needle, we have to go along and actually um, say that we would like to have the jab and then be vaccinated against it. Don't move to Texas. But we can quarantine them if they think that having them would be helpful to quarantine them. And the other problem is I think, you know, people that have studied botnets find that once they clean the machine, a lot of times they're immediately reinfected either with another variant of that bot or some other bot. Because the, the you know the user on the on the end of it isn't changing his behavior, isn't doing anything. You're just taking you know one of many pots off of the machine. So yeah, you gave me yeah. a lot. So, all right, excellent. I think we're out of time. So guys, thank you very much for your insights. Very good.